I want to bring in Kevin O'Leary right now for reaction on the Fed. Okay, so we got that quarter point rate cut. What was your reaction? Uh, it was so highly anticipated, I didn't expect much other than we were going to get 25 basis points. But here's the issue. If you look at the whole data set today, the big, the two big surprises. One, how strong the consumer remains up at that 3% growth, and also the 3% decline in CapEx spending with business. So these are offsetting, but you know, yesterday we were at 90% we'll get another Fed cut. I'm not sure now. I think the FUD may pause for a while. Things are not as bad as everybody had anticipated and not slowing as much as everybody thought. We look great on GDP that we're going to kind of hang in at that 2.8, 2.93%. And so the Fed has to be looking at this saying, I think we'll take a rest. So and the market is at peace with that at this point. Back near record highs. Yeah, yeah. I've looked. It's been... What's been so resilient are two aspects. Number one, the consumer remains the strong pivot of job creation in America, unemployment under 4%, and continuing to spend on a healthy basis. And, and yet, we're being thrown that bone on trade. We're being thrown that vision of maybe getting a deal over the next few years because we've got this stage one maybe coming on the 17th. I know it's a tertiary deal, it's mostly financials, it's not really IP and it's not really access to their markets but it's better than nothing, and the market is willing to wait for the rest of that. And when you look at stocks compared to interest rates, I mean, we've got the 10-year yield now at 1.8. The last time the market was at a record high in late July, it was at 2%. So just that difference could be a bullish sign for stocks. So I called around a few desks after all the data poured out in the morning and said, has anybody changed their mind about commitment to equities? Is there anything better to invest in right now for the next 12 months? Is there any strategy would have you go to cash? What has changed on this data set that would make you not want to stay long going into the back end of the year? There is nothing changed. You'd still rather be in equities. You'd still rather get those dividends. They're far better than going long duration on corporates or on govies. So I, I think we're in the pause that refreshes, but near the highs. What's wrong with that? So how would you be positioning your investments? Because I remember the end of last year, we were talking about how high quality dividend stocks were in vogue. Maybe tech had fallen out of favor, but maybe that's reversed now almost a year later. It, well, it's, it's interesting. Both have worked, because if you were willing to take the volatility provided by the high PE techs, you're back where you started. You've just had a bit, bit of a ride. But I have stayed, my core asset holdings remain my own index, OUSA, because I own you know, about 138 of the S&P 500 that have the highest quality balance sheets. That's a safe place for me to live. I don't tell people how to invest, I, it's what I do, because I want that 2.829% div yield I get. But I also use OGIG, which is you know, a huge basket of global internet players that include all the FANG stocks, and they're back up near their highs again. People want growth, but they don't want just domestic fangs, they want international growth. And I'll tell you the most interesting stocks that I think are in the market today are those Chinese internet giants with the hint of a trade deal, because they got slaughtered in, into the whole trade war stuff. They got pushed down to the lowest values they've been in a long time, and now they're coming back up with the idea that maybe we're going to get a trade deal. So we have a lot of cross currents coming from the political agenda, including our own domestic companies, but the market is waiting to see what happens next on trade. Uh, regulation risk when it comes to big tech in the final 60 seconds, how do you calculate that when you're valuing some of these tech companies? I'm getting unhappy with the idea that a politician knows how to break up a Google, an Amazon, or a Facebook. And I want to remind everybody that one narrative that has not come into the fore is Facebook and these other digital platforms are job creators in America. They create millions of jobs. My small companies would not exist without Facebook, without Instagram, without you know WhatsApp, without Messenger. We need these tools to acquire customers. The last thing I want is some politician telling me how to design the product. Let the market design the product. Let the market decide what they want to spend on a Google or on a Facebook. Let us do it in a way that keeps the government out of these businesses. We don't need to break them up, that's a huge mistake. We're gonna look like Europe soon, no tech companies. You wanna look like France? There's no France book. If you wanna do business in France, you use Facebook. Where'd that come from? America, because we have an environment to create great companies like that. Well, the last thing we need is some politician trying to use these platforms to get votes in an election cycle. I'm fighting back.
Although just quickly, I mean, take Amazon, for example. Do you really need Amazon retail and Amazon web services under the same umbrella? I mean, would it unlock value for shareholders if you broke up some of these companies? But the point is, IBM in the mid 80s, I use this example all the time, was a, was a giant, was the number one market cap company in the world. It blew itself up. It didn't need a politician to do that. It's, an, a, you know, it's, a, it's a shadow of itself because it missed the market. The market's changing all the time in tech. 40% of the sales of my companies come from Amazon. I do not want that platform broken up. It's working just fine. I don't need a politician to tell me how to design an American story when it's a business. Let them do their political thing and stay the hell out of this. It's working, we're creating American jobs. Stop messing with it, is my message as an investor and an entrepreneur and an operator and a supporter of tens of thousands of young people creating companies and jobs. We don't need those words. Hi, I'm from the government and I'm right. here to help you. All right, Kevin O'Leary, we will leave it there. Thank you so much as always. Hi, I'm Barbara Corcoran. I went from being a straight D student to running and building a $5 billion company. If your grades are terrible in school, there's one thing you must remember. They don't mean anything when you get out in the real world. Young people can quickly get defined by their GPA and it's meaningless. You're gonna be assessed by how hard you hustle and how well you do the actual job you're doing. And that has nothing to do with how well you did in school. Even if someone hires you despite your bad GPA, in two years, no one will ever ask you again what your GPA was, as long as you're successful in what you're doing and doing a great job. It's just a liability we have to carry around till we're about 25 or so, and then it's history. I can tell you that being told I was stupid when I was in second grade has been on my mind my entire career. My fear of being stupid still stays with me, but it makes me an over-preparer. It makes me competitive. Feeling like you're the underdog is the best asset in the world if you want to have phenomenal success. Be comfortable with being a loser. There is such a strength when you've grown up being the loser. You're comfortable being an outsider. You're comfortable with people criticizing you. And so you're free as a bird to be whoever you want to be. You can't get that when you've been molded to be an A student and think that's where your success lies. It may temporarily, but it ain't going to get you to the finish line if you're out to build a big success of yourself. I think the question that parents have to ask the kid who's not getting good grades is, are you trying your hardest? And if they're trying their hardest, I think you have to commend them for that. If all they could deliver to you is an average C, uh, be very happy with it. When my kids struggle with school, each of them dyslexic their whole life, whenever they got anything above an F, I hung it on our dining room chandelier. They were aglow from the time they were little kids. Why? Because they could feel my pride, and I was proud. My best entrepreneurs, the ones making the most money and building the biggest success and reaching their dreams. Barbara, I would love to do a deal. You're a smart Bingo. guy are the kids that didn't do well in school. If you haven't done well in school, I'm convinced that means you're gonna be a somebody. Barbara, in your new podcast, you talk about playing to your strengths, so delegating tasks that you don't like to do. And this tip really, that changed my life. So what do you do to take a step back and evaluate what works and what doesn't work for your life, for your career? When you are in a position, any job position, uh, there are certain parts of the job you enjoy and certain parts you don't do well. So sitting down and simply making a list, and I do this for myself probably every four to six months of my life, personal and business, all on one list, a line down the middle, what I love, what I hate, and I start stream of consciousness always with the what I hate. It's a long list, I hate this, I hate this, I hate this, <laughs> all this stuff that's bugging me. And then on the what I love, it's always a short list. And then I get rid of everything I hate. Get rid of it, say, who can I get to do this? And if you don't have the money as a young entrepreneur, you can barter. So if you hate bookkeeping, get a bookkeeper. You're good at marketing, you'll do their marketing brochure. Uh, so you can get anything off your plate that you're not good at. You have a much happier life that way. I can get unhappy intermittently because I feel overwhelmed. It seems like a, a grind work, but not for long. I sit right down and get my yellow pad, put the line down the middle and start writing. And it, even as you write, you feel the lift and you go back into the office the next morning feeling like a million bucks, like you can conquer the world because you can the minute you really keep your eye on what's important that you do well. Now, I've heard that you are a great spender, but not the best oh, saver. Oh, I love to spend. Saving? You're talking to the wrong <laughs> gal. I've never saved in my life. I'm very, very good at making money. 
I don't think it's the road to riches, so I would like to see that out of the deal. Good, that's fine with us. Great, okay, so I'm gonna make you an offer. Yeah, I'm not good at managing money. I think saving is grossly overrated. I know it's the prudent thing that's uh, the gospel of anyone in finance, including you, maybe. Um, I just believe it's not for everyone. Coming up the ranks, when I was a young businesswoman, when I became uh, an entrepreneur, I always overexpanded, wondered how I'd meet the rent. But I can tell you something, uh, they were motivators. For me, the first commission check I ever got, $340, I went right out and bought my first fancy coat. When I first made my first profit, 40 some odd thousand dollars, I went right out and bought myself a Porsche. And when I could afford a home, I bought an eight bedroom home because I promised a guy at dinner, I'll take that house, I hadn't a dime. But I ate spaghetti for eight months and closed on the house because I got the, the down payment together. I think money pressure could be a wonderful motivator provided you really have a clear idea where you want to go. When you have to find a way to feed your kids, to pay for the tuition, whatever, it's amazing the new ideas you'll think about, how creative you'll get, how many hours you'll work, what new angles you'll think of. What is one thing looking back that you think that was the best investment I've ever made? I mean, I know that oh, you have a lot of investments. But... Easily. Seven years of in vitro to give birth to my son, Tommy. I didn't know where that money would come from, but I knew sure as hell I was going to keep at it, keep at it till I could become a mother. You know, my family, I think I have 38 nieces and nephews wow. now, um, but I couldn't have children. That was a shock. I thought we were like rabbits. Of course we'll have children. It never happened. The experience of having my children and and raising them has been the most satisfying part of my entire life. And believe me, that says a lot because I've had so much fun and satisfaction from everything else I've done. All right, let's talk retail. Yeah. Uh, we've got uh, just winners and losers. Yeah. Uh, recently, we had uh, Macy's at a 52 week high. Uh, today, I've got Tiffany and Ralph Lauren doing really I just well. Heard that. And then I've got JCPenney at a 52 week low. Yeah. Uh, how is the landscape changing from where you sit? How can we as investors figure out like who the winners are? I, you know, I, I like that book that's out, Never Split the Difference. I don't think you should ever be in the middle. You know, if you have $40 to spend and you want to go buy a sweatshirt or a t-shirt, uh, you know, uh, if it's 45, then you're going to go, mm, I'd rather buy it mass or discount at 40 or I'm going to splurge, I'm going to spend 50. And I think that's what your JCPenney's and your medium people are. They're being compressed. But your person like a, 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 a Ralph Lauren and a Macy's, they're selling you also a lifestyle. They're selling you a membership. You're part of something. And I think as TVs and cars and houses get smarter, human interaction is actually of more value. So when you're going into some of these stores, they are knowing how to treat you and they have the data on you that they can get online. I think they're upselling that. Uh, talking about data online, that brings me to my favorite topic of Amazon. Amazon. How do how do you compete with Amazon in retail? Can you do? Does everyone just need to go like hide under a rock somewhere? And no, 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 no. Listen, you know what? T today, people don't have to buy anything from anybody. They have to buy they buy into a, an experience or a customer. Amazon's starting to open retail stores, so they're seeing the need to have to walk people through those doors. Retail is just going to change in various different ways. Amazon is going to be around. It's going to grow. It's going to start doing broadcasting and all that other type of stuff. But, you know, true entrepreneurs flourish within tough times and challenges like this because they don't sit back on their laurels and go, oh, my God, I'm good. They start to think outside the box. And I notice that the ones who are prospering are always the ones who think outside the box. Right, I want to ask you a couple sports questions. I don't know much about sports. But are you a football fan? No. No. Do you no. watch the You don't Sometimes, watch the Sometimes, but let's go. I'm let's not go. like a huge NFL fan right. myself either. But okay. the NFL yeah. rule change here that uh, players are yeah. not going to have to be on the field that they could stay in the locker room, but if they go onto the field, they have to respect the flag and the anthem. I think they got into trouble off doing that. I think that people were starting to come back to the NFL. I don't think that they should be doing that. We live in a free country, and I think that the NFL and the anthem for our military was only put in place a couple of years ago. It wasn't when they were singing the anthem. It wasn't due to the military. It was due to, obviously, other things, and I know that they are uh, they're hurting themselves by saying that. I think that uh, we should allow this country to be built up of free speech. That's exactly why we're so great and if a player decides to kneel then he kneels but he better win right because all the ones standing guess what if they if they suck on the field they're gonna be fired anyway right at the end of the day you're watching to see a, a, an athlete uh, compete do you worry about politics and business so we talk about how everything has become yeah. politicized like it you don't know what the president's gonna uh, tweet at a company it could be Amazon and uh, then we have uh, FedEx's stock can move on that it could be 
any company. Do you I, worry I do, about that I do, I, I do worry about some of that, but I'm more of an everyday small business entrepreneur, and um, I believe that if you leave all your faith and maybe a piece of document that you've gotten because you went to school, but then all of a sudden you don't apply yourself, or you think that one person is going to change the country and going to make sure that you're okay, however you're not educating yourself on how to uh, convert over in technology, understand what's going on, I think you're dead regardless. Mm -hmm. So I think that we can look at our politicians and they're going to come, they're going to go, they're going to be obnoxious, but you have to be in charge of yourself. And the day that you decide to depend on one person or a degree or a, politic is, uh, or a politician, it's a challenge. Yes, some businesses are going to be affected. And, you know, because of policy change, how much quota is out of China, but all others are going to grow, too. So I just believe you have to get up and you have to pull up your bootstraps and bust your butt to take care of yourself and your family. You got a lot of people busting their butts to get onto Shark Tank. Yeah. What's going on there? What's next? Shark Tank, about to shoot season 10 of Shark Tank. 10 years on there, there have been so many millionaires made. You know, Amazon bought one of those companies called Ring for yeah, a billion guys didn't dollars. Take it. Well, you know what? His valuation was crazy. And even today, he'll say, I was asking too much when I walked up there. But I did support him afterwards. I bought a couple. Okay. Um, uh, you know, um, it's an American dream. It shows that anybody can get up on that uh, carpet, and I always call that carpet for entrepreneurship, the ultimate equalizer. It mm -hmm. doesn't care about your sex, color, gender, or anything else. As long as you get to that carpet and you present the best you can, you're going to change, change people's lives. And the best thing, those entrepreneurs know us. We don't know them, so they know mm -hmm. how to push our buttons. They know I hate Kevin. Well, so they know how to pitch me, you know, push me against Kevin and things like that. Should we push, let's push some Mark Cuban buttons. Or maybe yeah. you, don't, you, know, you don't want to, but, you know, a Shark Tank uh, co-judge. Yeah. I don't know if you uh, heard recently that uh, with uh, sports betting, the Supreme Court has just come out and uh, basically a big ruling on sports betting. And Mark Cuban said that he thinks that it's going to double the value of anybody that owns a sports team because legalized sports spending will mean so much more revenue you and excitement follow the around money. them. What you got to follow you got to follow the money and if it, if you're getting more people in because now uh, people from just a financial greed or need may go into it and if there's more money and you can show that data it's going to double them. Wow, so Mark Cuban's right. So it's always about the money. End of the day, it's going to be about the money. And if somebody can make a dollar off of it, it's going to increase your dollar. I wish I had a good idea to pitch you. I'm working on it. <laughs> no I'm working on it. Okay, good. Uh, Damon John, thank you so much. Thank you. Some influencers don't say much, quietly making deals behind the scenes. Mark Cuban is the total opposite. The owner of the Dallas Mavericks is known for criticizing referees and presidents alike. His business chops go back to the 1990s, when Cuban co-founded an online streaming company that he sold to Yahoo for $5.7 billion. He has since invested in dozens of startups and continues to do so as a host of the show Shark Tank. Cuban is here to talk about how to pick the right investments, ignoring everybody else's noise, and maybe generating some of your own. Hello everyone, I'm Andy Serwer. Welcome to Influencers and welcome to our guest, Mark Cuban. Mark, yeah. great to see you. Thanks for having me. Mark, of course, entrepreneur, star of Shark Tank, owner of the Dallas Mavericks, and in fact, he's hosting us here today. We're at Dallas Mavericks headquarters here, right yep. across the street. Yep, from the, right across from the arena. From the arena, right. So, a whole bunch of stuff to talk to you about. Far away. But let's talk about um, this president thing. Okay. You know, that's out there. There are people who suggest that you should run for president. Maybe you have aspirations. I don't know, but it's a discussion point. So what would it take to have you run for president? I'm excited about next year for the Mavs. It's going to be a great <laughs> Come on, season. Man. Come on, man. Don't get I, off I, track. I don't, even, I don't even want to get into it. I mean, I did one quick interview, and then all of a sudden it blew up. I don't, I, I don't want to feed the beast. Right. Um, like I said, if there, there's a certain set of circumstances that would push me to do it, but we're not there yet. So if and when it happens, you'll be the first to know, Andy. Okay, that's very cool. What about the Democratic field? Is uh -huh. there anyone there that you think can challenge President Trump? Well, I mean, there's now and then there's November of 2020. I mean, if the, the election were held today, I, I think Trump would win, right? I don't think that there's, there's somebody that has the momentum or, or just the value of the incumbency that, that um, Trump has. But at the same time, between now and then, I think Joe Biden's got a good chance. 
and we'll see what happens with any of the other, the field of 97, to see if anybody emerges or if anybody new comes in. Um, I, think, I think Biden's capable of beating him, um, but we're not there yet. You've been critical of President Trump before. Um, have you kind of made any peace with them? I mean, you know, it's been a couple years. Yeah, I get a lot with them. Right. I mean, you know, we, we didn't have to make peace. We, I, you know, like any president, I agree with some things and disagree with other things. Um, it's not personal. Um, there's things I would do differently, and you know, but I, it was the same with Obama. It was the same with Bush. It was the same with Clinton. That's just the way. That's just the nature of the beast. So, have you talked to him and given him any advice, or what advice would you give him? I mean, I'm not a fan of the tariffs. Um, you know, if, if I understand what he's trying to do in, in terms of battling China, I, I would approach it differently because I think tariffs are attacks on the American people. But at the same time, I think we have a variety of other leverage points. I'll give you the perfect example. Um, Chinese companies on American Chinese companies listed on American exchanges have a, a market cap of more than 1.4 trillion dollars. That's a lot of leverage right there. Um, they're raising money via IPO, something we can't do in China. I'd shut down all Chinese IPOs. That first step, and given his propensity for using Twitter and just as a kind of throwing um, warning shots, you know, I would I would throw out there that we might put a halt on the trading of Chinese listed stocks in the United States. Now, there are American shareholders, um, but the reality is that long term, the value of the company is the value of the company, but a trading halt would certainly create a lot of disruption for those Chinese companies. And I don't think it's untoward at all to reconsider you know, treating Chinese companies like they, they do ours. Right. You know, we can't list on their exchanges. Um, I don't know what the SEC is thinking because given that every Chinese company has a connection in some way or, or another to the Chinese government, how does the SEC enforce any type of trading laws? Can you imagine if you're a big Chinese listed company and the, the government, someone high up in the government says, I'm, I need to make some extra money. Tell me how business is and what you're going to report. What's the SEC going to do to them, right? And so there, there's all kinds of enforcement issues that I think come up and I'm not suggesting that that's what happens now, but we have no idea of knowing that it doesn't. Have you ever run that by President Trump? No, no, I have not. Or anyone else in Washington? I mean, I've, I've talked to a lot of people in Washington yeah. about a lot of things, but it's, I'm sure it's not something that I think has reached his level. Right. I want to get into the SEC and about a lot of other sure. things as well, but let's talk a little bit about growing up. Uh -huh. You grew up in Pittsburgh. Yep. Your father ran an auto upholstery. We didn't run it. He worked shop. there. He worked there. Okay. Yeah. So what was that like, Mark, and, and how did that inspire you? I mean, my dad busted his ass. I mean, he worked six six days a week, um, left at 7, at 7, 7.30 in the morning, got back at 6 or 7 o'clock, um, lost his eye in an accident doing upholstery. He had a staple break when he was putting um, um, some covering on a car seat. Um, you know, it was, it was a, a middle-class upbringing. My mom did odd jobs. You know, they, they just wanted something better. I mean, my grandparents came over from Russia and, you know, my dad was the first generation. My uncles were the first generation Americans, like my mom too. And, you know, like every child of immigrants, they wanted better for their kids. You know, it's funny. I mean, a lot of people grew up that way, uh -huh. right? But not many people end up like you. So what do you think that's the result of? I think, you know, everybody's got something that they're good at. And the hard part is just finding it. And I found out early that I was a good salesperson, that I really liked business. You know, like I like sports. I mean, I read everything I possibly could, played sports as much as I could, just wasn't as good as I wanted to be. And, and business was the same way. I mean, as long as I could remember, I was buying and selling baseball cards, garbage bags, whatever I could find, stamps um, to collectors. But I was also reading everything I possibly could about business. And, you know, I was that unusual kid that, I'd rather read about Ted Turner than go to the movies. And, and so I think that created a foundation. And my parents didn't always, my dad used to always say, I don't understand what you're doing, <laughs> but I'm glad you're doing it. And, and so I had my ups and downs along the way, of course. But um, I just think that I just, I just put in the time and was fortunate enough to really get excited about business. And that paid off benefits over the long haul. I mean, you almost have to have that drive. Like, in other words, you can't fake it. You can't, no. like, pretend that you want to read about Ted Turner and, okay, I'll skip one movie. Well, it'll, it has yeah, to I be mean, in you your, can, your soul. Yeah, I mean, you can fake it too. You make it in a lot of areas, yeah. particularly if you're working for somebody else. But at the end of the day, um, 
if you're going to be great at something, you've got to make the effort to be great at something. Um, whether it's sports, whether it's physics, math, science, business, whatever it may be, you know, it's not just a natural skill. You've got, you've got to, to learn, and particularly if you're in the technology industry, because it changes every day. You know, when I got started, and, and you know, after I got, I, I got, a, I was a bartender when I first came to Dallas, got into the PC industry, got fired, started my own company, but there, I learned early on that there was always something new, and most people didn't put in the time to learn it. It's like now with artificial intelligence. Lots of people talk about artificial intelligence. Lots of people talk about machine learning and neural networks. Not a lot of people are putting in the time to take classes or do the tutorials or to, to learn how to apply it to business, and that's what it takes, and, and you know, that's just something I've always enjoyed, so I, I've been fortunate in that. Now, wait a minute, are you doing that with AI yeah, right Yeah, absolutely. Now? What, are you, oh, yeah. what are you doing? Oh, I've, I mean, I've been on Amazon doing the machine learning tutorials. Right now, I'm going through, um, I've taken Python online classes. Really? I, yeah, absolutely. Um, if you go in my bathroom, there's a machine learning for dummies book. Um, I just started uh, JavaScript neural networks. Um, there's a little tutorial where they've got most of the library, brain.js and all the libraries. And it's not, if you have a background in programming, it's not hard. But I'm not trying to be great at that, but I want to understand it. So I understand all the, you know, so I, the nuanced elements of it and how it works so that I have an advantage. But where would that take you? Like with your businesses here or the Mavericks or, you know, Oh, everywhere. Know? It takes me everywhere, uh -huh. right? I mean, there's nothing that AI won't impact. As big as the, so been, having been around a while, I saw the impact of PCs. Then I saw the impact of local area networks. Then I saw the impact of wide area networks. Then I saw the impact of the internet. Then I saw the impact of mobile. Then I saw the impact of wireless. You know, now I'm seeing the impact of, of artificial intelligence and it dwarfs any of those things. And if I don't understand how to apply it to my businesses, I mean, I remember selling PCs and software and walking in saying, you don't need to use that pen and paper on, on, a, you know, on a notepad or a ledger pad. Now we're gonna give you a spreadsheet and by the way, Here's a, here's a spreadsheet that costs $495, and I had to pay to go get trained on how to sell it, which is crazy now when you think about it. But then we said, okay, now you can play what if. Then we said, you can connect these PCs. Unless I understood the technology, how was I going to explain it? How was I going to understand it? Unless I understand it now, how am I going to invest in it? You right. know, then I got to go trust somebody who says, oh, yeah, I know AI, and maybe they do, maybe they don't. And it's really easy just to, have, just to okay, say, so you figure it out. That's just not my style. So you're building a base of knowledge, and then you think that at some point it's going to pay dividends in terms of... It already of, has. Right? I mean, if, if you truly believe AI is going to change everything, how are you going to understand what people are doing to change everything unless you at least have a, a foundational understanding of it? Now, I'm not going to build a million-layer neural network and try to change the world. I'm not going to show you... I'm not going to write a research paper and saying, here's how why the lottery ticket approach works and you can build smaller neural networks with less data um, and be more you know, um, resource efficient. But I can read that stuff and understand that when somebody says, okay, we're building this project and we need this size data set or this size data set, or we need this amount of resources, I can ask questions and understand the answers. So you grew up in Pittsburgh, went to the University of Indiana for a while, then you said you came here. How have you adopted this city? Why did this become your home, Dallas? Well, I mean, when I went to IU, I had a bunch of friends that graduated and came down here, and they're like, you gotta get your ass down here. The weather's great, the women are beautiful, the economy's good. I said, wait, back up. <laughs> <laughs> and right. I came down, um, lived six guys in a three-bedroom apartment until I found my way, and um, I've had a blast and loved it ever since. So how do you describe yourself, Mark? I mean, I said entrepreneur, is that how you would describe yourself? What do you do for a living? I, I describe myself as a grinder. Um, you know, I just, like we talked about learning, that's a grind, but I love it, you know, and I just, I think I've just learned what I'm good at and learned to focus on those things and, and try to, you know, utilize those, those skills to now, you know, not just be an entrepreneur, but probably more often now invest in and help other entrepreneurs. Okay, so take us through your business interests right now. You have the basketball team, you right. do stuff for Shark I mean, Tank, you, you have stuff here. You can go to markcuban.com, I list them all right okay, there. Right. And so really, I mean, I've got Shark Tank and I've invested in 100 plus companies there. We've sold a bunch, so I think I've got 70 that are active now. 
Um, and you know, it follows a normal distribution. Probably 10 are struggling, 50 are doing great, and 10 are, are, are doing incredible. Right. Um, but I think now I've, I've really evolved some of my focus to trying to help disadvantaged entrepreneurs, people who have less op opportunity. I just invested with a woman, Arlen Hamilton, um, who we together created a little million dollar fund where she's going out and finding 10 businesses run by people of color or disadvantaged LGBTQ type communities and just opening doors because I think my, my experience applies to anybody, right? Any entrepreneur, no matter what you're trying to sell. And I also think that it's a great business opportunity simply because the, the markets that they want to sell to are underserved. There just aren't as many entrepreneurs, so there's more opportunity. And so I, I think it makes great business sense as well. But let's go through some of these other things. So starting with Shark Tank, uh -huh. I mean, what's Shark Tank like? Is it really a kick the way it looks like yeah. it is? I mean, it, it's great. We start shooting here probably in a couple of weeks, June 12th or 13th, I think it is. And the way it works literally is we show up on set in, in Sony Studios and I get there about 8.30 and put on, they put on a little bit of makeup. I throw on my suit, like Kevin, Mr. Wonderful, Mr. And Wonderful. Lori, they have to get there two hours earlier oh, because they need they tons need of makeup. They need, oh, Kevin's you, got a lot more land. i listening to that. Kevin's got a lot more land mass to cover and, and Lori's Lori. Uh -huh. um, but in any event, we start shooting at about nine and they just bring in deal after deal after deal. We know nothing about them. They'll say, you know, this is, you know, Joe and Sally, and this is the name of the business, and they'll walk in and give our pitch. Now, on television, it might take 10 to 14 minutes. In real life, if it's a stupid deal, it might take 20 minutes mm -hmm. and then before we, we, we're all out. Right. And then if it's a, an intense deal, it could go 90 minutes, two hours, mm -hmm. and then they have to edit it down. But it's our money, it's all real, we know nothing about them. If we decide to do a deal, then we have the opportunity to do due diligence after right. the fact because sometimes they'll embellish, it's a polite way to put it. Yeah. You know, my widget cost a dollar to make and we sold a million of them when in reality, the widget cost $10 and they've sold six. And that you know, happens sometimes? Yeah, it does happen more often than mm. you'd, you'd think. Mm. Um, the producers are spo supposed to um, ferret that stuff out, but yeah. not a lot, doesn't happen as much as we'd like. So yeah, we'll do due diligence right. and about 60% of my deals close. Right. Um, the other little thing is of the deals that present to us and we'll see in any given season, 250 to 300 that are presented, probably 25% of people who pitch us that come in are taped and pitched to us don't even make it on air mm, for wow. a variety of reasons. Yeah, and, and let me ask you about your entertainment business, uh -huh. the movies and 2929 Magnolia. Uh -huh. What's that all about? Well, back in 2000, and 2000, I guess it was, after I'd sold Yahoo, right after I bought the Mavs, I started the world's first all high definition TV network. When everybody was saying high definition television is not going to happen, um, I created a network called HDNet and HDNet Movies, and there was very little content for it. I mean, literally, this is when high def televisions cost $15,000, and everybody said, who the hell is going to pay $15,000 for a TV? And I, w I w went around telling everybody, no, you just wait. Those televisions are going to drop like a rock in terms of price, and everybody's going to want one that goes on their wall instead of this big, ugly hunks of analog TV. So I had that, but we didn't have content. And so we wanted to go out there and create content. And we also bought landmark um, theaters, which we have since sold. But we wanted that vertical environment where we could show it on television, put it online, offer DVDs, um, put, um, put it video on demand, and also offer in theaters. And so we created... Um, we created 2929 Productions first, where we produce movies. What does that name mean, by the way? 2929 was because the address for AudioNet, the, the streaming company we created, yeah. was 2929 Elm Street. Right, okay. So that's where that came from. Right. Um, and then, so we had movie production 2929. We had Landmark Theaters. We also bought Reicher Entertainment, which we've since sold, that owned Hogan's Heroes and some others so that we could put it on HDNet. HDNF Films, and then Landmark. And so the idea was to have it vertically integrated. Mm, right. So we were the first company to, um, to, put, create, to produce a movie, put it online, download, they basically offer a day and date release of it called Bubble. Um, and we, we've been doing Magnolia and um, 2929 Productions ever since. The others, um, yeah, Magnolia and 2929, the others we've sold. What do all these businesses tell you about the economy right now? What do you think 
the outlook uh, is? Well, that's a good question. So some of my smaller Shark Tank companies that, are, that resell products are getting crushed by the tariffs. I mean, I've got one that may go out of business simply because tariffs at 10% were one thing, tariffs at 25%, they just can't compete. Um, there's other companies that have bigger and better supply chains where they were more creative and were within 5% of their prices, but now with the tariffs, it's, it's almost impossible, and the uncertainty, it's made it very, very difficult. Um, but beyond that, I mean, business is, is going well in urban markets, and it's a little bit tougher in smaller markets. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, it, it pretty much mirrors what you see in the general economy. Right. Are you surprised at how long the stock market rally has lasted? No. I mean, if you go back to 2008, it's pretty much on a straight line. You know, when, when President Trump got elected, it was a little blip. With some of the things he's done, it's taken it back to the straight line. So it's, it's pretty much, you know, where you'd expect it to be. There hasn't been, I mean, like any market, there's going to be ups and downs, but there hasn't been anything dramatic to change it. Are you concerned about a recession or the market faltering? I mean, I, I'm concerned about black swan events, the anomalies that can hurt us. I think in general, you know, the markets tend to just go up, you know, yeah. on their own, by their own weight. Um, and so there's no reason for that to change now. Maybe if the, the trade war extends or something happens with Iran or, you know, again, there's something aberrational that puts us in a difficult situation, then it could change. Um, but otherwise, I mean, there's no reason to think that other than stocks, individual stocks, you know, doing what they do, that the market won't continue to go up on the same line that it has since 2008. You mentioned the SEC earlier, and obviously you've had some issues with them. What, what do you think about the SEC, just generally speaking? I think they're kind of useless. You know, I think if the SEC really wanted to make the market safer, they would publish bright line um, guidelines. So, for instance, there's no law, specific law on insider trading. There are only precedents, legal precedents, that have been set as a result of various cases that the SEC has brought. Well, if you run a public company, that's okay because you probably have a general counsel who's training you and doing it um, on what you should and shouldn't do. If you're just an investor, you have no idea. You, you're not a lawyer and you shouldn't be responsible for you know, talking to a lawyer before you design, decide to talk to somebody at a company or, or make or sell or buy or sell a stock. And I'll give you the perfect example of some of the stupidity. There was a case, and I forget the name of it, where a guy was going to work. It was a railroad company in Illinois, I think. And every day he'd go to work. One day in the parking lot that everybody shared, there was a bunch of limos. And then another day there was a bunch of limos. Mm -hmm. Then another day, the guy guessed, literally guessed, that the company was being sold. And he bought stock. The SEC sued him. Right. Now, the SEC lost. But that's just some of the yeah. ridiculous stuff that they do. I'll give right. you another one. I, we had a company, ShareSleuth, that um, did research on some companies, and they found a company that was putting out press release after press release about how great their business was with this new energy solution, I think it was. And um, we sent somebody out there to just look at the factory. or just called. We didn't even send it. We just called the factory. Nobody answered. Then we called somebody local. I think it was the power company and said, do you have power turned on for this location? No. Called up somebody local, go look at right. this building. Nobody was there, right? Company, we shorted stock, company died. The SEC did nothing. Right, Didn't right. care. Yeah, so what's Didn't the care. difference, right? Let me ask you, what do you think about uh, Elon Musk's war with the SEC? What do you think about Elon Musk generally? I mean, I don't know him very well. I mean, I've talked to him a couple of times. I like him because he's competitive. He's obviously got, you know, a genius spirit and, um, and a mind for innovation, which I love. Um, but he's also very competitive. Mm -hmm. And when you've got a bunch of bureaucrats trying to come at you um, in a world where there aren't bright line guidelines, that's tough. I mean, it's like when I was battling the SEC, it took everything I had not to just say F you every minute of every day because it was ridiculous. I mean, if you know, in some of the due diligence and um, that we were able to do, the things that they said about me, the you know, the ridiculous approach they took, you know. And so when you have that coming at you, it's hard. Now, I wasn't running a public company at the time. He is. And so, you know, he, 
he's under a different microscope. But like I told him, it was like, you got to just try to bite your tongue no matter how hard it is because they don't care. They don't care. They're only in it for skin on the wall because they're, like in my matter, there were, there were people who left the SEC before the conclusion when I kicked their ass in, in, in the trial I had, and they would put on their resume, worked on the Mark Cuban matter. Right. And that's what I told Elon. This is a resume builder for them. They don't give a shit. About, they don't care about you, right? They care about their resumes, and that, that's tough to fight. And I also told him, I said, look, here's how stupid the SEC is. Name the last five people that you know that you can remember that were sanctioned by the SEC for violating, SE, violating insider trading laws. You name, name me, Andy, tell me. Can I, you name, I can't name anyone. That's, that's, and so when the SEC does these enforce, enforcements thinking that they're going to impact people trading, it's ridiculous because in this day and age, there's, you can't communicate that to people. It, it, you know, it doesn't, people don't think, wow, this guy got busted, this guy got busted, this guy got busted, a woman got busted, so I better not do this stuff, or I better learn because he did this or she did this, and so that's an indication that that's the wrong thing to do. No, it doesn't work. There's, 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 there's no educational value, if you will, and there's no disincentive based off of the findings from the SEC or the rulings that they have or the court rulings they have. It goes into the ether and nobody remembers it unless you're in the securities industry. Right. And so it's kind of useless. Their approach is kind of useless. I'll give you another example. You can go on YouTube and look this up. So I, I try not to talk to um, CEOs of public companies whose stock I'm considering buying right. because I don't trust the SEC. So there was an instance where I was thinking, well, maybe I want to talk to the CEO. And this was a couple of years ago. So I put, took my camera and I started videotaping myself calling the SEC. And I identified myself. I wasn't trying to be underhanded. And I said, look, I'm thinking about talking to this company. I don't know if this would violate any SEC rules. Is there anybody I can talk to that can give me guidance? And so they sent me to another person and recorded that, sent me to another person and recorded that. Finally, they sent me to a web page. And that web page was a picture of a letter from 1980, no lie, saying I needed to fax eight copies of a request right. to this number. Right, right. That's our SEC. Right. You know, they're not they're not helping at all. Right. And you right. talk about, and I can go on for days, yeah. and I won't talk here. But yeah. one other piece: if you look at all the ETFs of foreign countries, right, right, if those foreign countries stock markets that those e ETFs sold in America represent, right. They don't have all kinds of enforcement yeah. requirements, yeah, right, right? Right, so it's a whole... Yeah, and so yeah. it's not like we're letting people invest in these markets where there's not right. enforcement because it really doesn't net out right. to be anything right. of any value. Speaking of Silicon Valley a little bit, um, what do you think about Facebook and Google and those big companies? Should they be broken up? Are they too no. big or do no. they need any enforcement? So there's two pieces there. Mm -hmm. One, just looking at the state of the union, if you will, I mentioned earlier that AI is, you know, the biggest thing that's happened in a long time. Well, if you talk to Vladimir Putin, he says whoever dominates AI, AI is going to win, you know, is going to be a dominant nation. You talk to China and they talk about their 2025 or 2035, whatever they called it, plan that was built around AI. In the United States, we don't have those plans yet. But what we do have is five to ten really, really big tech companies who dominate the research and development in the AI space. Mm. If you were to break up any of those companies, Facebook, Google, as examples, Amazon, well, we're going to lose our greatest competitive advantage that we have versus the Chinese and the Russians in a space that we need to dominate. So that's part one. Now, maybe that gets resolved over time if we invest as a country more, but that, that is a big issue. Part two in terms of breaking them up, you don't have to use Facebook. You know, you don't have to use Amazon. Um, it's not like there aren't alternatives. You don't have to buy from Netflix, you know. So I don't, I don't see them as utilities like the phone, where the only way you could use a phone was to go through AT&T back in the 80s. And even then, all they did was give access. Now, I do think there are privacy issues, but those aren't breakup issues, right? right? right. I think the law, like if you look to, say to Facebook, don't ever sell your data to anybody else. Right. Think about what's happened. Now Facebook has control of all that data. Right. You talk about the law of unintended consequences, yeah. well, you've made Facebook stronger, not right. weaker. Right. 
Now, if anything, you sh there should be a, a built-in delay and they should have to publish that data, anonymize, and make it available to everybody. Mm -hmm. That's how you solve the problem. Um, and then you also have the other issues of you know, the content that they present being harmful or misguided, um, brutal in right, some right, cases. Right, yeah. And I think, they're high, I think for them and for Google and others, that's where you change the um, copyright laws. Right. Right? Back in the day, there, were, there wasn't really the consideration that there would be forward-facing videos and other content that would be protected by the, um, not the whole, um, uh, what is it uh, for the copyrights? Um, safe harbors. Right, yeah. Right, okay. so now uh -huh. there's safe harbors, right. and then yeah. the copyright owner has to send um, a takedown notice. Right, right, right. We should go back. A television station, is, for example, you guys. You guys can't just pull off something offline, right. uh, online, and just present it here right. and broadcast it, right? Yeah. You've got to get permission, right? right, right? right. You've got to sign a licensing agreement. Yeah. That's the way it used to be for digital copyrights, and we should go back to that. Right. So that Facebook just can't say, well, it's none of our business, right? And if somebody has a problem with it, issue a takedown notice, and we'll try to use AI to proactively recognize if there's a shooting environment, right. you know, something horrible is going on, right? If you flipped it, so that the DMCA safe harbors only protected you for inward facing as opposed to outward facing yeah. videos, then just like Yahoo Finance, just like every TV network, you have to go out and get a license, yeah. then it all changes and you're not gonna see that right. horrific right. content. Yeah. You're not gonna see because those people aren't gonna sign a license. Right, interesting. Let me shift gears a little bit, Mark, and ask you about economic inequality uh -huh. and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and her agenda. Um, what do you think of that, and why do you think people find it so I love appealing? AOC. I love AOC, right? Um, I don't always agree with her, but I think um, she's learned the lesson of social media where you get long and you get loud and you get people's attention, and then you deal with substance after that. But what do you think when she says that the idea that we have billionaires in our society is immoral? I mean, it's a, it makes for great headline porn. I mean, she started a business Bernie Sanders has a book business. You know, Elizabeth Warren buys and sells houses or did, right? If they would have had the level of success that I and others have had, I, d I don't think they'd be complaining as much. But that doesn't mean that there's not an income um, inequality problem. There is. And it's something we have to deal with. I, I tell, you know, other business people that, you know, the greatest cost to business is social disruption. If people are rebelling and burning things and aren't, you know, aren't satisfied with their lives and, they're incented to do horrific things, or you, that's the greatest cost of business, and that, that costs us more. Now the question becomes, how do you how deal do we with address it? it? Yeah. Right. So, I'm not a fan of trickle down economics. Right. Where the, the I don't think that works. I don't think it has worked. Where you know the richer people get, the more they they make available to others. Hasn't worked. I'm also not a fan of trickle down taxation. Right. The concept that just tax you know those who have a whole lot more, then all of a sudden it'll find its way to those who need it doesn't work, hasn't worked, won't work. It's not that taking more money, I'm, I'm okay with paying more taxes, I don't have a problem with that. Where the issue is, how do you make it work, Yeah. right? How do you get it? Now, the reality is, anybody who's working and getting paid by the hour is gonna have a challenge when something goes wrong, right? right? Do you lose a job? Does the dishwasher break? Does somebody get sick? Um, is it more than your deductible, or, you know, or if you haven't covered your deductible yeah. yet, can you cover your deductible? If you're getting paid by the hour, it's hard to save money. I don't care if it's five, ten dollars an hour, fifteen, or fifty dollars an hour. It's a difficult position. The only way that people really acute, improve their wealth is by buying a house, condo, whatever it may be, owning shares of stock. And so I think that's where you start to change the rules. I think when you have a company like. Um, Oh, we, um, Uber changed, but oh, who was it that just, was it Pinterest? W where there's multiple shares, like Snap has got multiple mm. snare, um, classes of stock. Yeah. I think you tax them differently. Mm. If every, every share of stock in a company in a public market is not treated the same, then it should be as, um, it shouldn't be, oh, I'm trying to think of the right way without stepping on too many toes. If you have an advantage class of stock, right. it should be treated as normal income when you sell that okay, stock, right. right? If you have, if everybody's got the same share of class of stock, then you treat it 
as um, capital gains. Right, right. Right, if you've held it for more than a year. I think you also advantage people if you have a company where all employees are offer stock, you give them other tax advantages. Right. Because then, to AOC's point, you're lifting from the bottom up. Trickle down is not gonna work, but if you create opportunities where people all have to share in stock, then the disparity is going to decline because everybody's gonna go up when things happen. Like when we sold broadcast.com, we created 300 millionaires because 300 out of 330 people invested their stock. Right, right, right. right. So you, when you work from the bottom up like that, people have a chance to increase the value of their wealth. When you, if somebody's below a certain level of income and they're able to buy a home and you give them more tax advantage, you don't take away their, their, um, their deductions because they're in California or New York, right. you, you know, when they have a lower income. Now they did some things to offset, but still, you want people to be able to accumulate assets that enhance, that grow in value, that appreciate. That's how you get people so that they, their position, their, their life becomes better. Okay, let me ask you about America. I mean, people are bitching about America. Is there something wrong with this country, or is it just the usual stuff? I mean, what I think is it's the usual thing? stuff? Yeah. Right. I mean, now everybody's got a platform, so it's a lot easier to bitch. It's it. <laughs> you know, I call it headline porn. You're only going to get attention. The more dramatic you are, the better chance you have of getting attention. Mm -hmm. And that's just the nature of the beast. I mean, there used to be gatekeepers to media. Now there's not. And if you're loud enough and either crass enough or maybe it's a great idea and people get behind it enough, um, then you're going to be heard. It doesn't make us bad. It's just the game has changed. I mean, there are problems like our health care system, well, right? How yeah. would you fix that? And the, well, the mass shootings, there's shootings. There's well, I think first, you know, there, there's, there's a book I read in high school that I ended up buying a copy of. It's called Why Men Rebel. And basically what he said was when your expectations for your life going forward are increasing, but the reality is diverging from that. And so what you thought would happen with your life and where you are gets further and further apart, then people do things that they otherwise wouldn't do, whether it's a mass shooting, whether it's, you know, who knows what, cheating, something, whatever it may be. Right. And so, I mean, I think taking care of income inequality and lifting people up from the bottom and creating more opportunities and giving them tax advantages maybe it's an, inc um, an earned income credit, whatever it may be, then I think you'll see fewer of those events. You know, other people will say it's a mental health issue. I, I don't think we've, we've had all those same type of issues, you know, for hundreds of years in this country. I think it's more about when people really get disappointed and they have nothing to lose, they'll do things that people with nothing to lose will do. Is the guns a problem as well? Yeah, I, I would do guns completely differently. You were listening to some of my last interviews, weren't mm -hmm. you? Uh, <laughs> yeah. I would do guns completely differently. Um, I, would, I would go to change the Second Amendment in ways that people probably wouldn't expect. Um, you know, it's not easy to change an amendment, but what, what I would do is change the Second Amendment so it said, one, every American citizen has the right to own a gun, period, end of story, written in the amendment. Two, um, the federal government will never be allowed to ever confiscate that gun from an individual, mm -hmm. period, end of story. Three, states have the right to manage the ownership, the purchase and ownership and management of guns owned and held within their borders. So that if you live in a state like Texas, if the law in Texas is open carry, so be it. Mm -hmm. If you live in Pennsylvania where they're more stringent and they don't want you to be able to have a gun other than in your own premise or you know, under lock and key or you know, have to do a background check, then that's up to them to decide. And so if, you know, we're, we're trying to take a Second Amendment that has been analyzed up and down and backwards and forwards and it's created its own set of problems, you know, let's update it. Right. Um, we got to switch over to basketball sure. and talk about that. So I want to ask you a bunch of questions. So first of all, state of the maps right now. Um, I think we're in good shape. I mean, we have Luka Doncic. We're bringing back Kristaps Porzingis. We have cap room. So hopefully we'll be much better um, than we have been the last three years. Right. You had some issues here with the culture of the team mm -hmm. with um, Tradema Usri. And um, I know you apologized for that. You addressed that. How did that culture happen? And, do you feel well, like you've addressed it? If I, I knew it wouldn't have happened. Right. And yeah, I think we brought in Sint Marshall and I think she's done a phenomenal job. She's been here over a year and I think it's a whole new culture, a whole new Mavs and, you know, 
like I alluded to earlier, we've learned that diversity creates opportunity, and now we're able to sell into markets we never were able to sell in before. So I think it's made it a better place to work, a better organization, um, and a better foundation for the future. What about the NBA overall, Mark? What, what's the state of the NBA? I think it's great. I mean, I think you like Adam love, Silver, the job that yeah, he's doing? Yeah, I love Adam. I love the job he's doing. Right. Um, I think we're, we appeal to you know, a variety of demographics. I think our audience is growing here in the United States and globally. Um, there was just a survey saying we're the, the number one sport in China. So you know, we are truly a global sport, I, and so I think our future is very bright. Golden State Warriors, the most annoying team ever in the history of the NBA? I'm not going to go there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to lead you on to that one. Yeah. What about the Lakers and what's going on there? Magic was just sounding off You know, the I've other said day. it many, many times. I hope they suck, and I hope they suck forever. <laughs> now, know. that one you wanted to talk about. Yeah, but I've said that before, right. right? I said it about every team, right? I want them all to be awful. Just one team I want to be good. Right. And what about your, you know, history with, with refs? Uh -huh. Have you mellowed? Are you, I mean, there's no conspiracy yeah. against Mark Cuban, or, or is there a conspiracy? I mean, there, there, there were moments where... Look, refs are human too, yeah. and they have biases like everybody else. But, you know, my challenges with officiating has always been about management more than the officials. And so I've, I've paid my fines, and some things have changed for the better, some things still need changing. And so I'll keep on working on it. If it means taking a fine, I'll take a fine. Generally speaking, uh, Mark, as we kind of wind things up here, you have lived your life as an iconoclast. And in a way, that's a template for other people, but in a way, it isn't. So, in other words, how much. You've got an ordinary person, ordinary man or woman. How much of an iconoclast could you or should you be like Mark Cuban? Oh, I don't care. Just, you should just be yourself, right? I mean, I, I take pride in the fact that I didn't give a shit what anybody thought or said. I was just going to be myself and, you know, I'm my dad's son, I'm my mom's son, I'm my, my brother's brother, you know, I'm, I'm Alexis, Alyssa, and Jake's father, Tiffany's husband. This, you know, I just try to do the best like everybody else. I mean, I've been blessed. You know, like I say all the time, I'm the luckiest guy in the world, and I just try not to take it for granted. I try to enjoy every minute, and I think now as I've gotten a little bit older, I try to give a little bit more back than I have before and, and try to help more people. And, I, you know, in terms of whatever, if anybody else finds themselves in my position, just enjoy the moment, enjoy every minute of it. I mean, I guess my question is, are you a role model for people in society? I don't know. I mean, I never thought of it. I, I mean, it's not something I try to be. I just try to be myself. You know, I just try to, to, to help where I can, do what I can, um, be a good dad. And, you know, I, I, I don't, I'm not trying to be something for somebody else, just myself. And finally, do you have any notions of where you want to be professionally or personally 10 years from now? You know, I think... I mean, I, do you have plans like that? I don't, not specific plans. I, I mean, I try to put myself in a position now where I, I can have an impact. You know, you talked about running, you know, there's, there's a variety of ways to, to have an impact. Fortunately, people open their doors for me. And so whether it's working on healthcare, whether it's working on crazy ideas like changing the Second Amendment, whether it's supporting, you know, talking to, to Senator Schumer, he's got um, a program that creates more doctors, which if you're gonna reduce the cost of healthcare, you're gonna need more doctors because supply and demand. If we ever wanna get to universal healthcare, United States has got 2.3 doctors per thousand. Scandinavian doctors have, um, countries have 50% more. You know, but those are types of things where I can start having an impact. I can start, you know, spending some money on things that lead to change, helping entrepreneurs, whatever it may be. So I don't have a specific plan. I don't have a specific bucket list. But I, I hope that all these things I'm learning can lead to some level of change. So we'll see. All right, Mark Cuban. Thank you very much My for pleasure. having us here today. Thanks. You've been watching Influencers. I'm Andy Serwer. We'll see you next time.